Payroll for April totals $11,849.67. Volunteer payouts that are included in the warrants total 3684 and this reflects March's activity. There is a payment to Suzanne Kinsey for $1,070.50. Pacific Power Generation for $2,043.63. Shell for $1,236.01, Puget Sound Energy for $1,368.11, and U.S. Bancorp, which is our credit <coughs> card, for $3,176. Payroll for April totals $1,849.67, and this represents one month's salary for Chief Carlton in the amount of $4,000. 166.67, one month salary for Assistant Chief Shields in the amount of 2,583, and there's one meeting for three commissioners and the secretary at one meeting. And we require motions to approve warrant requests covering current month vouchers and current month payables. Thank you, Michelle. Do you have any point? I have no questions. I'm ready to make a motion. Good. Would you like to make? <coughs> I'll, I'll make a motion to approve current month payables for $25,178.22. I'll make a second motion for the same vote to approve the payroll for April, which totals $11,849.67. I'll uh, second both motions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Both motions passed. Thanks, Michelle, again. Good um, <coughs> report. Any correspondence, Steve? Yes. Uh, we received a thank you letter from the Blaine School District. Uh, during this, uh, the big snow that we had, uh, they asked us uh, while we were clearing our parking lot if we would actually go to the school and clear the school parking lot so the kids could get uh, into the classrooms and stuff. Yeah, we did do that. And uh, they uh, wrote us a thank you letter. Also, uh, at the end of that thank you letter is a hold harmless if we caused any damage <laughs> on their property. <laughs> so I'll pass, I'll pass that around, but it's very, very nice uh, of them write that. And then we also got a uh, thank you card from the prep group, uh, and it's uh, title to myself and the fire commissioners. Uh, the prep group thanks you so much for allowing us to have our community awareness meeting at the fire hall. Your presentation was very much appreciated and stimulating. We hope to gain new members and are looking forward to being assistance to you and your members. Please feel free to call us at any time that we can be of assistance. Sincere thanks, Virginia Lester, uh, prep president. And uh, that's from that. So we had a great meeting uh, that night. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here, 40 or around 40 people maybe here that evening. And uh, discussed emergency preparedness with the sheriff's office uh, was here represented uh, as well. So it was a good night. Those are the two correspondences that I have. Thank you, Chief Coleman. Appreciate it. Moving on to the chief's report, and uh, I'll leave it up to you, Chief, uh, if you want to have Ms. Kelly come up first. Do uh, so you just want me to get through the chief's report real quick? Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> I, there's four points of information this month uh, regarding uh, my education and traveling. I'll be traveling to Tacoma for a two-day fire department uh, officer administrative workshop. Uh, on conducting internal investigations and firefighter discipline on May 1st and 2nd. Uh, I'll be traveling to Portland for a cross-border symposium on May 12th and continuing to Denver, Colorado for a community paramedic conference. Uh, Chief Shields will be overseeing the meeting in May. Uh, I will not be here. To explain the cross-border symposium is uh, organizations from ac across the United States and the Canadian border. Uh, get together once a year and uh, we discuss issues with patient transports across the border, uh, working with the Canadian system, working with the U.S. system, the U.S. system working with the Canadian system. They always build, build in an EMS portion, emergency medical services portion to that. And I'll have the ability to sit in on that, also uh, portray what we are dealing with here uh, in Point Roberts, 
uh, to our transport dilemma sometimes, and also be able to talk closely with the Department of Health uh, in the state of Washington to discuss uh, more support from that level in uh, liability issues for this organization when we do transport uh, some of our uh, patrons here, whether uh, a full-time citizen or a visitor uh, to a Canadian facility. As I've stated in other meetings, that currently the liability falls on this organization uh, if we make an inappropriate transport with a sick patient into a Canadian facility. Even if they're a Canadian national, we can be held liable for that. We have to ask ourselves if BC Ambulance Service would be transporting the patient to the same facility uh, or if they'd be taking them to a higher level of a hospital such as Vancouver General or Royal Columbia, which we do not transport to. So everybody wants us to take them to Delta. Uh, they just want to get to Delta. But I can tell you that Delta is not the appropriate facility for major trauma, stroke, or cardiac patients. Um, overseeing all this, and the big, uh, I guess, apple on the tree, is that the Department of Health does not give me authority uh, in the North Region Guidelines or under State of Washington, authority to transport into an international destination. So uh, anytime we do that, it's at risk you know, of liability for this <coughs> district uh, if a person wants to come back and goes, why did you bring me here in the first place? You know, you should have taken me to an appropriate facility. So I'll be asking the Department of Health to help us with the liability uh, overreach, stating uh, something in writing at the North Region EMS uh, Council that does allow for those types of transports to occur when and only when we can get them to an appropriate facility. And Delta, Delta's fine for broken arms, uh, minor fractures, those types of things, but when you have critical patients, uh, from the meetings I've had with Delta and with BC Ambulance, we need to look to a higher skilled facility. And that facility is St. Joseph's Hospital uh, in Bellingham at this point. So uh, that's what the Cross Border Symposium will be uh, benefiting uh, the organization by. And then the community paramedic conference. There's a large national push, also international. Uh, Canada is doing it in many provinces over there. Also around the world, in the UK, Australia, is that uh, pre-hospital EMS personnel, uh, emergency medical personnel, are being utilized in more of a, for a better word, home health care approach uh, within their communities. Uh, Dallas uh, is an organization in the Minneapolis area as well. Uh, is reaching out to those who have been in the hospital and they, that live within their response districts. They find out that they're being released from the hospital and they help that person get back into their home uh, without any hiccups uh, once they're released from the facility. This is something that I've spoken to, uh, our, I've touched base with our nurse practitioner, Natalia, um, up here. And uh, she's definitely on board with putting something like this together for our community as well. And it would allow our EMTs that are here during the week, uh, myself as a paramedic, and the EMTs that we have on the weekends, to uh, go out, meet people, make sure they're doing okay, uh, trying to reach out and solve any issues that they may have with medications, being able to get to the store, those types of things. But we always have to remember that we're an emergency response organization too, so we're going to have to balance that. Uh, in the light that it may be our only available EMT. So we won't be a service that goes in and cleans homes uh, or anything like that. So all of you get that off your <laughs> check mark. Uh, it's for uh, purposes to reduce uh, their need uh, to travel to their primary care physicians. Uh, a lot of the bigger systems use it to reduce the burden on 911, the frequent flyers that we have in which we call people who uh, are high users of the 911 system. Uh, in Kansas City, this program has been put in place as well. They have a nurse hotline, and in some instances, it's reduced the frequent users of the system by 10 to 30 percent or greater on the 911, and overburdening burdening ERs as well. So being, uh, trying to find out more information on that and building a hybrid program for our community here, I think is a great outreach that hopefully we'll be able to do at some point in our future for the community. 
Um, work will start on the station projects next week. Uh, we're getting the last parts of our windows replaced. Uh, that will include all the windows around the clinic. Uh, we're getting a kitchen, uh, a kitchen remodel upstairs, and also we're redoing the two upstairs bathrooms. We're making a bigger shower up there because there's guys that are bigger than me on this organization and when shoulders touch walls and showers that's not a, obviously a good thing. And then uh, we'll be finishing out the bathroom that's roughed in with piping right now. Uh, we'll put, be putting in fixtures and making that a primary female bathroom when we have a female firefighter here. And if not, then there'll be two male bathrooms upstairs, one with a shower and one just to use as a facility. Uh, I contacted Camps Painting uh, in Linden. I contacted them and they'll be on site sometime uh, this coming up week to review the ceiling of the cracks uh, in the parking lot and to also look at possible striping from the handicapped spots uh, to outline a safe pathway to the doors uh, from those positions. And then they'll give us an estimate on what that would, uh, what that would cost. May I comment on that just briefly? I did see down in Bellingham where I can't remember where, but one parking lot was in a world of hurt, I guess. And they literally took out the asphalt from the handicapped parking spaces into the front door. They replaced the asphalt. Hmm. Now, I could have seen that this morning, maybe at Target or something like that. But I saw it on that well. You know, maybe that's the solution. <coughs> Camp's painting would be the solution to that. Yeah. Uh, what kind of builders would be doing that? Yeah, there's, the big issue we have with our parking lot is the alligator. Mm -hmm. is the alligator presentation that we have, and it's because the ground's shifting underneath, uh, causing that alligator and causing it to separate and cause cracks. Uh, it's never been sealed better than it is now no. uh, from the time that it was first done, I should say. So if we can uh, seal any of the cracks that weren't sealed very well or that are larger than normal, uh, out there within a reasonable amount of money and possibly stripe the handicapped uh, areas to uh, access the buildings uh, better than they are now. Then uh, if it's not an astronomical cost, it's something we may look into or should consider in the future. Um, apparatus, there's nothing to report except on 858, um, the battery started to boil and they've never been replaced since we bought that rig and that's our eight red ambulance, so we took that uh, over and got our batteries replaced in that, so we wouldn't be down an ambulance. 85802, <clears throat> it's not on this report, it didn't happen last month, but I'll let you know that 85802, our second ambulance right now, is out of service because we have to get the radio, radiator repaired or replaced. It sprung a leak and leaked everywhere, so it went down to uh, Richmond Ford, is that correct, uh, in Richmond, and uh, it's going to be fixed over the next few days. So it puts us at risk if we get two calls because we don't have two transport ambulances right now, but uh, we'll have to bring ambulances all the way from North Whatcom or Whatcom Medic 1 depending on the emergency at that point. We will not be able to rendezvous on that second call. We have 41 members currently. We lost, we've lost a few members to career hirings. Uh, we have 29 Canadians, 7 Point Roberts, and 5 County, uh, two paramedics, myself and one other. Uh, we have 14 EMTs, including two uh, EMT advanced um, intermediate techs. So volunteer hours equal 2,488. Volunteer payroll was 10,099. Combined chief hours, uh, last month I put in 186 hours. Assistant Chief Shields put in 153.75, with a total of 339.75 hours between the two of us. Just want to make sure everybody understands, that's the time that we spent here on the point. That is, I will not be counting the time that I go to Portland, that I go to Denver for these conferences. This is time that we're physically here on the point uh, doing our jobs as the assistant <coughs> and the chief officer. So it doesn't include classes that we go down in the county fed. We don't add those hours in. Uh, we had 11 calls last month, uh, five EMS calls. Uh, one uh, patient was airlift, airlifted to the hospital. We had two no transports, one to Walk Medic 1 and one to North Walk and Fire. We had a public service, uh, one call, and it was a lost party. We received a phone call of a voter that was trying to come up during uh, some bad weather, and uh, he was low on fuel, and we went down to the marina, and he was just coming in, we found him, and everything was okay. And we had one agency assist, and that was an object on the beach. Uh, 
What type of object was that? That was a navigational flare that the Canadian Navy was out doing a bunch of stuff and fired a whole bunch of uh, 40 millimeter. <laughs> it was a big object. It's a big object. And they were floating up on the beach and everybody that says they found called the police or the military. So they called the police. So they called the police and the police called us. <laughs> and we were called. And then we looked at it and said, it's... Uh, your problem. Your problem. <laughs> and then we left. Okay. That's how that call went. It was pretty easy for us. It was good. Fire classifications, we had four. We had one on off us burn. We had one gas leak. Uh, we had a water problem as well. And then we had one power line down. And that completes my chief's report. Thank you, chief. Appreciate it. Mr. Kelly and the chief, I'll hand it your insurance report. So I'd like to introduce Anthony Kelly of Kelly Insurance. Uh, he's been uh, working with me uh, very, very closely over this last month uh, discussing the insurance providers that we have. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to get it down. Uh, we just got new information in that he brought up with him that I didn't have earlier today. So we've actually uh, reduced it to two out of the four possibilities. Uh, our current insurance provider is still one of those two that we are considering, and that is CIAW. And the other insurance provider we are now uh, considering is ESIP. And uh, so Enduris and VFIS uh, have been removed from the process uh, due to multiple different factors with that. Uh, there's a number of things that we discussed last meeting. Uh, what importance we would like to put in different areas uh, when it comes to this organization and the coverage. We need to remember that CIAW is a pool approach and within CIAW, how many agencies are currently with CIAW? There's uh, 110 cities and I believe 105 fire districts. So 215 different organizations with CIAW and their ceiling is 100 million. That's the total. Yeah, that's the total amount of money that they have to use is a hundred million. In the pool. In the pool. Right. Now we discussed, do they have a stop loss above that? No, it's that's the aggregate number that's available. Yeah, it's a hundred million. Okay, uh, so that's CIAW. They're a pool, and if we had something catastrophic happen, uh, then we're part of that pool, and that money gets divvied up until it's all used up. Uh, that's the current place that we're in right now. Um, they've always been very responsive to any claims that we've made. Uh, they're very good. Uh, the overriding thing that they have that no other carrier really has is an education component. They do offer um, classes here. Uh, they will come all the way to the point and give us one-on-one -on -one classes for administrative purposes or if I want to put on classes uh, for conflict resolution for, or leadership courses for our volunteers, they would also come to the point uh, for those courses. Uh, in conjunction with that, they have e-based learning uh, courses that you can also do as well. But their big component, they, they will send people to come on site and, and train. <clears throat> uh, five components that, or six components that I've really written down in, in, in importance is the replacement of the building. So we've increased the value to 2.5 million from 2.1 or 2. I increased that to 2.5, and then the property inside the building from 108,000 to 300,000. And that's everything inside the building. Uh, if we catastrophically lost everything. Uh, the apparatus I increased values on. Uh, the engines are now 400,000. The ambulances are 165,000. Uh, both the Tahoe and the uh, Battalion 58 are at 65,000. The air. Cascade is, I think, at 20, uh, roughly 20,000, somewhere in there. And uh, the hazmat, is, I raised it from 8 to 10. So I've raised all of our limits to replacement cost or to replacement value. So it costs the district the least amount of money if we had to replace. The issue with placing limits is uh, ESIP holds a 75% value. Every carrier will go through the process of if they can fix it, they're going to fix it. But then again, if they fix it, they have to do what is called, they have to bring it up to current standards as well. And our vehicles are both over 20 years old. Once is, one is 23 years old, uh, and the other one is just at 20, if I believe yeah. that's correct. 
So we have a 1991 and we have a 1994 engine. Um, so all that would have to be worked out at the time uh, the accident or the claim was processed. And then we go back and forth on do we buy something used, how much money are they offering for that, or are we going to be able to get the entire 400000 to purchase something new for this community that is up to date for our firefighters and has better safety standards in place. Uh, so my list is of importance is the building, the apparatus, the property, uh, any added benefit to the volunteers, and then what happens in the earthquake scenario, because they do rate uh, uh, earthquake here in the Puget Sound area as probable, uh, and we never know when something like that's going to happen. Uh, then the education component. Uh, there is a difference in cost between the two uh, providers that are left on our list. Uh, and I'll let Tony uh, go over those costs at this point. Uh, Honorable Commissioner Mersing and Commissioner Riffle and Secretary Michelle and Chief Carlton, Chief Shields, members of the community, citizens and residents of Point Roberts, thanks for having me. So uh, to be real quick, uh, to get to the point here, uh, these two remaining uh, insurance, one's a pool, one's an individual policy, uh, the emergency services insurance program, somewhat more expensive, uh, three to $4,000 difference. Uh, the City's Insurance Association of Washington, their fire district program, uh, with these agreed values that we moved up, uh, so we have 1.465 or 1,465,000 on all the apparatus, which are those ambulances and engines and command vehicles. Uh, currently, we have 2 million with 108, so these numbers are uh, as you know, this is a September 1 renewal. Uh, so we can make changes, uh, you know, at your discretion immediately, or we can do it at the renewal. But uh, basically, with the numbers that we have existing now, which is the 2 million and 108 on the stuff inside, we're $17,032 with the CIEW, and the ESIP is 20,631. And uh, what we look at, one of, the, one of the valuable tools inside of the CIAW program, which, uh, uh, as you might know, there, there are other members uh, in, the, in the area of the Point Roberts Parks and Recreation is one of those members that's part of the CIAW. But um, they definitely, we, we look at their driving training simulator, which uh, we attempted to get it up here last year. It was a brand new one. We've had it here in previous years. But that comes up for three or four days. Uh, all of the uh, drivers get a chance to get in a real life, one hour long training simulator that, uh, that to me is a life saving device. It bills out about $5,000 for that three to five days of, of work. Uh, and then also some of the other member driven uh, in service training, which typically when we had the commissioner's training, if, that would, if, that, if you hadn't been a member, you would have paid about $1,500 to $2,000 for that. So there, there's some values inherently built into the uh, City's Insurance Association of Washington that comes as your member uh, and with the third party administrator, Canfield and Associates, and their solutions uh, group there to provide you risk management, loss control, and uh, of course, in-service training. The uh, Emergency Services Insurance Program uh, does have a $1,000 deductible when it comes to uh, earthquake and flood. And uh, the CIAW has a 2% or 50,000, so there's uh, a fair amount there. The question that comes forward is the preponderance of our claims are accident related, bodily injury and property damage, which is usually a human factor. Uh, the other ones, uh, of course, direct physical loss, uh, typically fire, wind, uh, we, we refer to those as uh, direct physical loss. That could be vehicles hitting the building or something of that nature as well. Vandalism or malicious mischief those types of things, but uh, technically um, the, the earthquake, uh, and coming from a geologist myself here, it's like, it's not a matter of if, it's when and when they hit. So we experienced, of course, in the 60s, we had the uh, Anchorage earthquake that we all felt down here and tsunami warnings and such, no real damage. Um, some things fell off the shelf and such. We've had other smaller earthquakes up in the Marshall Hill area where we've damaged some of the local houses. Uh, and then the Nisqually earthquake in 2001 that actually uh, hit the Puget Sound rather hard. It was a 7.2 earthquake. And uh, 
you know, there was uh, quite a lot of damage in the Kitsap Peninsula area. The CIAW uh, has a sister pool, the School Insurance Association, Washington. They, they incurred less than 100,000 in losses in a 7.2 earthquake for that whole region of the west part of the state. So, in, in essence, earthquake is very real and it cannot be discounted. And it could be the one that we all regret. That, you know, it could be of the magnitude that everyone in the whole Puget Sound area suffers from. And what's the likelihood of that? It's relatively, uh, well, it's somewhat predictable, it's also unpredictable. So, uh, the basis of what I'm, I'm here to say is I think we have done our due diligence. Uh, the chief has the information to make an informed decision at, which will best suit the uh, fire district five and Point Roberts Fire and Rescue. Uh, with that said, if there's any questions or concerns or uh, statements that I could uh, take back to the risk manager, I'd be happy to do that. Conveniently, uh, the CIAW board is having a retreat and a board meeting next Friday, the 18th, at uh, Seneana. So I'm going to attend that, and I invite uh, any of you to attend. Uh, it's an open public meeting. Uh, uh, let me know if you're going to attend so I can let Joanne know that we're coming. But uh, it's at 9 o'clock on uh, Friday morning next week. And, and so part of what I know there from my own experiences these, uh, in a, over a 30-year period is that uh, these are some of the same risk managers, Bill Ritchie and his uh, group of uh, loss control folks and adjusters and uh, and marketing folks all going to be there, and it's something that I'd like to I'd like to invite you to. Uh, as you might know, uh, the Emergency Services Insurance Program is an out-of-state program, and it does indeed cover the whole nation and uh, easily access. And there's a fellow, Bill Dixon, that picks up the phone. I talk to him on a regular basis. So the ease of communication <coughs> is there with all insurance companies. I don't want to lean one way or another on that, but definitely uh, it would. Uh, as members of the CIAW, I encourage you to <coughs> take a closer look at what the board uh, is doing and on your behalf be very informative. So again, I kind of leave it there. Uh, it's where the, the, the chief, uh, with my help, has, uh, has gone through this uh, very diligently uh, and has looked at it from um, all perspectives. And so I think he's done an extraordinary job in reviewing this uh, to a great extent. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. Any questions? I've got a question, not, not of Tony so much on this, because I know you can't say certain things in your position, but you talked a lot about CIAW. Why is ESIP worth $3,000 more? Simple question. Simple question is a lot of their things, they have lower deductibles uh, within that, and it's a private insurance. So we have a certificate of insurance directly with the SIP. It's not a pool. We are guaranteed the levels that we set. So with a pool, a catastrophic event, how probable is that, right? In a pool, there is a risk that the money available in that pool could all be used. And then we have very little money that is given to us, or we do not meet the limits we had set. So if we set 2.5 with the SIP, we'll get 2.5 if it comes down to a full replacement minus the deductible um, for you know that, that emergency. Where, and this is in the catastrophic event, um, ESIP, guaranteed replacement value, is pretty much down the board. Uh, we have agreed value with CIAW and ESIP, the same, which is that we set the limit that we feel we can get a new truck for. That's why uh, the 1994 Darley went from 325 to 400,000. That's why a vehicle that is a 1991 that on the open market may, may be worth 50,000, we have set a valuation of 400,000 at because if we lost that vehicle, that's what it would take to replace that vehicle uh, in today's market. We may even pay out a little bit, uh, and the 400000 would not cover the entire cost. Now, there's salvage and everything else built in that. But ESIP, <clears throat> to me, uh, my understanding, it has protection because it's our own insurance, it's our own insurance certificate, meaning that 2.5 million is 2.5 million. Am I speaking correctly? Yes. 
on that, where CIAW is a pool, and there within that pool, there's always the risk of the pool uh, being depleted of its funds that it has available. What what is your recommendation to companies? <clears throat> well, there's no perfect company. No, okay, that's true. <laughs> so, uh, in regards to CIAW, um, I don't have experience with the SIP. Uh, in regards to their claims, but I understand their claims department is very uh, proactive in paying out the claims, uh, getting the uh, customer their needs met, and getting them back to full force. Uh, CIAW, with the claims that I've processed for this organization, has been extremely responsive and uh, good to work with in regards to paying the claims as well. And I've used uh, Mr. Kelly uh, in, in that process, calling him, saying we we have this claim, he helps that claim be processed, and we put forth the money that it costs for repair. And I've always gotten a check very, very quickly from Canfield uh, Insurance uh, within that CIAW framework. <clears throat> so here's, the, here's what I, we need to make a decision on, is is the extra 3,000 a, a benefit for this organization to spend and not be part of the pool? and have that guaranteed money, uh, that it is our money. There's nobody that will share the limits that we have, okay? Uh, or do we stay with a company, which is a pool, that all members will be grabbing into or utilizing if the Puget Sound gets hit with an 8.5 and it disrupts all of the people that are part of CIAW in the Puget Sound area. And not everybody's diving into that pool to rebuild themselves. Um, again, the, the other benefit is, or the other thing we have to consider, so money versus risk, right? Of uh, the pool being drained or having our own certificate. And then the value of education. So everybody pretty much knows I'm an educator, and CIEW does offer the educational piece uh, that ESIP does not. And that is, uh, as far as I understand, the SIP would bring people on site uh, if we asked for that, but they, they like more of an e-based type of learning. We know CIAW, uh, that's one of their founding principles within their education, that they send people to you if you desire that, and they'll put on those classes at your location. We understand we're in a difficult location, but they still come here. The driver simulator is something that uh, really no other organizations get to partake in, and it helps our members be better emergency drivers. And again, it bills out about $5,000 for a three-day stint, uh, which we would not be able to afford, obviously, uh, not being part of CIEW. Uh, earthquake probability, um, the extension of any benefits that the insurance companies or the carriers <coughs> give uh, above and beyond the volunteers. Both carriers, uh, it seems through our, through our viewing, our primary providers of insurance, if one of our volunteers gets in an accident responding to the hall uh, on district business, then those companies would be primary insurance, their personal insurance secondary. Uh, ESIP uh, pays up to $1,000 deductible for a member's home if it gets damaged while on duty uh, for the district. So if they were not there to be able to protect their home, then uh, basically ESIP would pay the deductible for their home insurance for that volunteer. So there's a little, uh, you know, there's a little back and forth there for the volunteer benefits. <clears throat> you know, is a certificate having truly our own certificate of insurance important? Or are we okay with being with the pool because it offers an extension of education, you know, to our district that ESIP doesn't. Um, having that certificate, is it worth an additional possible $3,000? We haven't gotten numbers back from ESIP on the increased level of 2.5, 300,000. So that'll be coming back. But we did get that back from CIAW, is that correct? Yep, and they were going to charge an extra uh, 2,222, easy number for me to remember. 20, so basically, Basically, CIAW is a seventeen thousand plus the twenty two hundred, so we're at, we're at twenty thousand with CIAW, with all the increased limits 
the $300,000 property, um, the 2.5 for the building. And again, you stated it yourself, Commissioner, that we live in an area that to rebuild, <coughs> to uh, have construction, just gets more expensive every year. Yeah, and I, I want to point out, I don't think I was clear in the last meeting, it's not a cost per square foot when it comes to a building like this. We're, we're sitting in a room with a 12-foot high ceiling <coughs> for a purpose. I mean, it was needed for the big hall, but uh, it's a cost per square foot. A 12-foot high ceiling is certainly higher than the cost for an 8-foot high ceiling. We have an electric panel system that easily exceeds $100,000, just, you know, just a basic that let alone the distribution throughout the building. It's a very good electrical system. And things like that, this building has that's unique. Things that you don't see, the decon room is unique. We spent right. a lot of money to have that decon room. So I So we're looking at twenty thousand with CIEW staying with the current provider that we with that we have on board. Um, we've been with them as far as I looked, I think since two thousand four. Yep. Since two thousand four. <clears throat> The earthquake hasn't hit yet, <laughs> and we haven't had to um, see any results of being part of a pool in a major disaster. Well, maybe to set your mind at ease with the earthquake a little bit, when we did the remodel of the building, this particular wall, uh, no, not, was it this wall, it's the far wall, uh, was set up for cross lateral, which brought it up to somewhat code, okay. today's code, and we, we drove it. A lateral force going back and forth, you know, that's how the book does it, based on the wall directions. Who knows where the force will come from in the earthquake, you know, it can be 70% straight up to the ground. So, but... I would read, my, my perspective on insurance is, uh, I'd rather be a little over-insured than under-insured. And it's cheap, uh, for me it's cheap to purchase that, but it's cheap to come up with funds when you don't have them because you were underinsured at the time. Now, I like the comfort, again. <laughs> I, I don't know why earthquake is such, why it's, it's bothering me so much. Well, it's gonna happen in any Yeah, why it's bothering me so much in the approach. And if we do have a magnitude that uh, hits the entire Puget Sound area, and uh, multiple customers are trying to rebuild the cities that were involved, uh, the fire districts that are involved, uh, there's, there's a possibility that they could go to their max within the pool of money that is available. How likely is that? I, I, would, I want to say it's, it's, it's low. It's a low probability, but it's there. Where if we were with ESIP, we don't have that risk. Bill, but we lose, <laughs> with ESIP, we lose the education. Okay. Can that education be uh, like the driver's training? Which seems to be important. Can that be purchased on the outside? Well, it would, it would run us the five thousand dollars, you know, to have it here for three days. So it's it's out of our scope uh, to try to bring it in. How 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 often have we had a similar issue? Uh, since I've been here, we've had it every year, <coughs> except last year yeah, when they got stopped at the border <laughs> because it wasn't. And, it, and it, to make it even more humorous is that. A retired state patrolman was driving it, and uh, they still wouldn't let him cross the I thought, uh, I thought they were trying to sell it in Canada. Because they wanted a, a certificate of bond or insurance on it. Transit bond. Transit bond. To guarantee that you're going to the next international country. And it wasn't marked yet. Uh, it was brand new and it didn't have it marked. Yeah, so the, this, this simulator, the brand new one, we have not experienced yet. And it has two full, <coughs> two full simulators uh, in this brand new one. And it is a value. I will say that I, I'm a proponent for education. Um, and it, it's a value. When we have young drivers, uh, when we have the turnover within our district and train new people on a constant basis to be drivers, and they're limited uh, within that experience, uh, to give them any additional experience and things that we cannot actually do on the road, like blow a tire and have somebody hold on to the wheel and not drive the vehicle off the road. That's what they learn in this simulator. Uh, blind spots, when a tire blows, to accelerate and to pull over versus brake. Um, those types of things, which again, I would demonstrate out there if we want to lose a vehicle. <laughs> but uh, we can test our insurance out at that point. <laughs> but we, we have no other way to simulate those types of things. Okay. 
And uh, I've been happy with CIAW. I, I truly have it. And I do value the education of them coming here. Uh, and it's, it's the cheaper of the two, but then you have the risk of the pool. And that's the risk we need to weigh. Well, I know Bill's put a lot of thought into this. What do you think? <clears throat> I don't like the pool. Uh, it's like asking each and every one of you to, would you like to have your home insurance policy shared with a with hundred neighbors? You're going to say no. Uh, on the other hand, we've been dealing with uh, CAIAW for, for 10 years, right, John? Mm -hmm. At least. Yeah. They've provided good service. There's a lot to say for loyalty here. There's a lot to say for promptness. There's a lot to say for no asset. <clears throat> and they haven't been. And there's a lot to say for the, for the education part. Uh, you know, talking about earthquakes and floods, yeah, I, there's no beginning and no end to that. <clears throat> you just don't know. There's no winners when something happens. There's, there's no insurance company is a winner and there's no insurer that's a winner. So, you know, you go with your gut feeling a little bit and you go with some, some knowledge from this stuff of what you guys tell me. Ah. Shouldn't we be <coughs> possibly dividing education from the insurance as a separate factor in our operations? Just a question. How uh, we have a separate Thing where we get drivers training somewhere else instead of relying on the insurance company and then we don't have to deal with the pool. It seems to be a very strong thing in favor of CIAW. Uh, that earthquake could be an 8.0 five minutes from right now. We don't have a fire hall. We'll have enough time to get out of the building, but the fire hall will not remain standing. It will not withstand an 8.0 earthquake. Sure. Okay. Contrary to popular belief, building codes only make you make the building to withstand long enough for the humans to get out, not to save the building. It states it right in the code. <clears throat> but you have to read the appendices. <coughs> Anyhow. So the education component that you just spoke of, so let's say it's roughly 5000 to bring up this uh, driver trainer on a yearly basis if we decide to go with the SIP, which doesn't have access to this device. Um, and also, we're looking at if we want to offer uh, ourselves as, uh, for the commissioners as the administration uh, of the organization, uh, a training such as we had in the past, uh, we're looking at a thousand dollar day, uh, any training that we want to bring up in those four months too. Well, so be more, we could also travel for it. I realize you can't travel for driver simulation. Maybe you can. Maybe it would be a district seven at some point and you could buy into it. Uh, but it's very difficult logistically to get everybody down there. So. Right, and that's why the, the prominence and the benefit of them saying absolutely we'll come to you uh, is a benefit for us, right? When uh, those instructors will come here and not ask us to go somewhere else. We do have it built into the budget that uh, the commissioners can travel to uh, conferences. Uh, outside, we do have a travel budget in every division. Uh, the EMS division, the fire suppression division, uh, we, have, we have travel costs and money for education purposes. Uh, I'd probably be having to look at adding 10,000 into those areas uh, in order, 10,000 total, to be able to give us the ability to bring up the trailer to have people still come here to the point, offer us administrative leadership training, uh, oversight training. If that's something, we've only used it once, and that was last year. Uh, so it's not like we're using it every quarter. And uh, if we use it once a year, then we're looking at, you know, let's say just a thousand to two thousand uh, dollars. If we want the driver simulator up, we're looking at five grand or whatever that would be for the driver simulator. So, and then again, if we go with our own certificate, we're looking at uh, to acquire that, it's the additional cost of three to, we don't know yet, uh, to be honest with you, but CIAW came back uh, with the 2.5 and the $300,000 uh, stuff on the inside of the building at 2,200. So I'm assuming ESIP is going to come back within that range within plus or minus 1,000 
of that figure as well. I could probably say plus <laughs> uh, to that figure, so roughly 3,000. So it's 20,000 versus 23,000. And having your own certificate, having certificate or being part of a pool. Yeah. Education we can work through. That's right, we can work through that for more money. Um, I, I pretty well know what I want to do, um, but I'm only one of two here. Well, I think we owe it to the community to have the best possible insurance available. And a pool is not the answer. Uh, it can be a very dangerous situation. They've been a very, very good thing apparently for our, our fire district. And I feel that we need to divide education away from insurance. I realize it's preventive maintenance for them. Uh, but I, I think that a division needs to be made that divided themselves just from what we're offered. ESIP is, ha, I hate to overuse things, it's the gold standard. Yeah. It's what we should have. We have the funds, thanks to the taxpayers of this community, we have the funds. And I think that's what the taxpayers want. I think they want excellent insurance. They want us up and running in case of a catastrophe. This community does not want to be bothered having a fundraiser to do something that the insurance didn't cover or the pool fails. So I have a tendency, I... Let it out, Stan. Huh? I'm ready to... I'm ready to make a motion for ESIP. I'm not sure if we even have to make a motion. This is an operational decision, but I'm sure to support the motion. Uh, and, uh, and at least we go on record that way. And I realize that it's probably going to cost cost us to get that education for the driver simulator, <coughs> which I agree is extremely important. But I really think we need to divide education away from insurance in this case. And ESIP is the, the gold standard. That's the way I would go. Okay, Chief. Now, thanks, Dan. Put your little uh, thing forward. Within, <coughs> do it within a minute if you can. Yeah. Do it within a minute. Yeah, just say who you prefer. Uh, I, I have to say that CIW has, has given us good service. Through this education process uh, of talking to the individual uh, insurance agents, uh, working with, our, uh, with Tony as well, um, and Tony's had great things to say about all the providers. Uh, he hasn't lead me towards one provider or the other. He's given me the information to bring forwards to this commissioner panel to allow you to make the decision uh, at, a, at a public meeting. So uh, I like the idea of having our own certificate. And that's what ESIP gives us. That we're not dealing or competing with other organizations uh, that are impacted by the same <coughs> disaster. Uh, that, may happen, that may happen at any time. So do I like that? Yes, I do like that. Um, I, I'm sure I can find a solution to the education uh, component of this and hopefully be able to bring that out of my budget. We'll, we're with CIEW until September, so I'm happy to utilize that uh, trailer, uh, the driving simulator, until that point of time uh, because we still are insured by them through that period of time. So benefit from them while we have them. But uh, in 2015, for the budget year, and we'll have to look at that, and I'll have to do some configuring for that type of education. And doing my best to try to also get um, ESIP to bring people here to the point, which they've alluded they would uh, if we've asked, but they're <coughs> heavy-based e-learning. So computer learning, what they have. Well, and I do support the change to ESIP uh, because the underwriting value of having that individual certificate. That was like a minute and a half or two minutes. Well, you have a different minute than I have. <clears throat> hey, uh, well, you, you said your thing, you said yours. Tony, thanks for all your input. I follow the two gentlemen. Same, same company. The ESIP? ESIP is a new company. Same company that you guys talked about. Okay, good. I just wanted to make it clear that we're on video. That's it for that. 
Um, does a motion be necessary on that? Or? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Unless you want to go on record. <coughs> no, no, I think we made our point quite clear. It's on the camera, so. Okay. Okay, Michelle, you got that? Good. Anything else about uh, the insurance company issue? No? Tony, do you have anything to add? Um, not other than the, uh, uh, the, the point that we were uh, discussing about uh, low probability and high consequence things, like you mentioned about, you know, if you really want to see what it's like when the earth comes to an end, you, you don't want to have your heart go out to the people at Oso. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Chief and Tony, between the two of you, you can work out the details. As long as you know that we need to, uh, that you feel the deadline we have to work with. Uh, one point though, this uh, currently the program is at September 1. Yep. Correct. So I presume, unless you want to short uh, No, we'll just leave it out. At least that's how I would feel. We'll leave it the way it is. We're happy. Okay, and then okay. make sure that we have a nice smooth end of the transition. The only thing I would add to that is if ESIP comes back at an additional $10,000. Uh, oh. Something that puts out puts them out of reach yeah. financially for this district, uh, and if that happens, if it's uh, if it's within, I, I I guess I'll set a limit. If it goes above five thousand uh, dollars for the additional uh, coverage from the two point five million and three hundred thousand for the inside building things, uh, I'll come back to this panel and uh, uh, let you know. Well, Chief, here's what, here's what we'll do. If, if once you get your firm estimate on it, you let each of the commissioners know individually, then if uh, we feel, or if either of the three commissioners feel that we need to talk about it some more, we'll call a special meeting. We'll ask you that then. Okay. <coughs> Sounds good. Yeah. That's, that's what put them out of reach, though. Yeah. yeah. You'll let us know any of it, right? Yes. Good. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Okay, moving right on. <clears throat> Unfinished business. Uh, business, we did that. That was the insurance issue. Then we have two resolutions that we'd like to talk about. Chief, I'd like you to take the lead on that. Uh, or I can do it too. On the, let, let's do the easy one first. The uh, proposal of a uh, uh, new time of our meetings. I was kind of wishy washy, but <laughs> I'm not really uh, hesitant to bring it up actually. But. Uh, when we took the vote last year in, in uh, September, I think it was, we went from 7 p.m. to 4 p.m. <coughs> that was okay. Um, I think uh, having done the 4 p.m. meetings for a while, for half a year, I think it's come to my attention and then to my ears that uh, uh, most people prefer the uh, uh, 4 p.m. time frame. Thinking about it some more, I say, yeah, okay, I can understand that. That's why we asked Michelle to draft up the resolution to change it back to from 7 p.m., which was our intent to go during the summer, at 7 p.m. back to. 4 p.m. Mainly so we have, those who attend meetings have more time with their families, have dinner at night, maybe a barbecue, etc., etc. Now, uh, Stan, how do you feel about it? And after, after you talk about it and, and put your two cents on the table, I think it's a bad idea. We, just, we have a good sampling of the public here. A lot of them are regular to see what they feel. Well, I think most everybody knows that I'm in favor of the 4 o'clock meeting on a permanent basis. Okay. Let's open it. Up. All right. Can I do a straw vote from about this with you guys? What do you feel? 4? 4 o'clock, no? Anybody opposed to 4 o'clock? Anybody opposed to 4? Put your hand down. You're not opposed to 4. You're opposed to 4 and 7. <laughs> <laughs> 
four and seven. <laughs> Two meetings. <laughs> um, okay. Now, so we have a we have a resolution. Every any time we do something drastic like this, we're changing times. So the people have to be informed, uh, like newspapers and stuff like that. We have to put it in the form of a resolution. So, we didn't hear from Nick on this. Are you you feel the four o'clock is. <laughs> you like four o'clock as well? I love four o'clock so much. Okay, I think what I see around the room is easy to make a motion to approve resolution uh, 2014-01 to change the meeting time permanently to four o'clock in the afternoon. I'll second that. Then we're all those in favor? Aye. Uh, motion passed. Uh, motion to the resolution passed. Okay. Right, you'll make note of that and make sure that it is in the whole points <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. Or, um, as opposed to last month, it wasn't in the... Almost like the yeah. SSA official. Uh, that would be nice. Yeah. 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 It somehow was not in the printed copy. The fire commission meeting was not in this month's no. printed copy. No, we were not on there at all. It was somebody... It's on the e It's on the e It was the e was in, in the e that was very small thing. Very small. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll set an official. Uh, uh, but I think it should be noted new permanent meeting time. I think it would be wise for a couple of times. New permanent meeting time would be great. I, I could write it all by myself. Would you? <laughs> right. Okay. We'll see. I believe it. Okay. Uh, that was the first resolution. The second resolution is keep up an eye. Uh, the second resolution is governing a change in transport fees. So when we pick up a patient, uh, how much we charge per mile and at a base rate to get someone to a facility. Uh, in Whatcom County, uh, there is now established an oversight board uh, and a technical advisory board. And this is a change then uh, with anything that's happened in the past with the current EMS system. Due to the voter approved 2005 um, docket that stated that Ferndale Fire would become part of the paramedic transport system. And this is what has led to the establishment of an oversight board and a technical, uh, technical advisory board as well. Meaning the oversight board is made up of leaders within the county, county council people, medical directors, those things. The TAB board is made up of uh, pretty much individuals from the organizations that are involved uh, throughout the county <clears throat> with some uh, different people here and there on both boards. They have approved a change uh, to increase uh, transport fees in Whatcom County for all agencies to follow. And uh, coming to the board and asking for a resolution to be uh, placed in front of them is to make sure that we're on the same page when it comes to transport fees of our patients uh, to emergency facilities. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the current fees that the two ALS providers, those who provide paramedic coverage uh, from their organizations, that would be District 7 and Bellingham Fire, which would be the two ALS providers in the county for purposes of transport at the paramedic level. Uh, current fees, District 7 charges uh, for an ALS transport $750. Bellingham Fire uh, charges $675. The Oversight Board uh, recommends for that level of call uh, to be set at $750 uh, for all agencies to follow. Now, a BLS agency, currently it's $550 for District 7, uh, $450 for Bellingham Fire, recommended by the Oversight Board, which is made up of all the county, uh, county execs, council people, and uh, physicians, and, and others of, amongst organizations. They recommend a BLS transport fee of $590. So an increase of the highest fee that's currently being provided of $40. Uh, per mile right now, uh, District 7 is charging 15 cents per mile, or actually $15 per mile. 
<laughs> 15 cents would be a great deal. Yeah, <laughs> Let me make sure I say that correctly. So $15 a mile. Uh, Bellingham is asking they pay $12 a mile, and the oversight board has recommended a $15 per mile uh, charge. So it's the <laughs> base fee of $550 plus $15 a mile. Uh, so if they're BLS transported from here, we do not bill for the intercept that we do with North Walken Fire Rescue or Walken Medic 1, depending if it's a BLS patient or an advanced life support paramedic patient. Uh, we transport to Checkpoint Bravo, which is 99 and what road? Ladner Trunk, sorry, exit 20. 10 or exit 20, uh, Ladner Trunk. We, do, we cannot bill for that intercept for that travel. So the patients don't get double billed. Uh, where they start getting billed and the mileage starts getting tacked on is from Ladner Trunk, if that's where we decide to rendezvous with a county unit coming up to intercept that patient from us. And again, that doesn't uh, put us in a position to where we have to transport all the way down to St. Joseph's, losing our only apparatus possibly and our only EMT for the better part of three hours or more, depending on order. Uh, so it's a great relationship to have with North Walkham. But they start the billing process, and you're only going to receive a bill from either North Walkham or uh, Walkham Medic 1, the transport agencies at that point. So these are the uh, positions that the Oversight Board or committee has uh, recommended, and uh, I, I believe the County Council did approve it as well. The City Council is going to be looking at it, hopefully approving it. Now these are recommendations. And the reason why I'm recommending this board follows these recommendations is from this point forward we don't have to change resolutions because built into the resolution uh, it states that we will follow the recommendations of the oversight board and the fire chiefs association from this point forward regarding transport, transport fees uh, within the medical side of what we do. So that's what the basis of the resolution is, is to get on board with what the county has recommended and to stay there. Uh, throughout the years by having the auspice in the first page of the resolution uh, that if changes do happen that I would just come back and inform you of the changes and then report that to our building company. But this will be the only resolution that will require. That's correct. Yeah, that's I correct. I certainly have no problem with being prepared to make a motion. Go ahead. I make a motion to approve uh, resolution 2014-02 02 uh, change in transport fees. I'll second the motion. And we're all in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Uh, wish you were well for the idea. I think that's it for the evening. Uh, if anyone of the public has anything to say or talk about, if you do, keep it short. I'm one of our to listen. No. Yeah. One question I have, thinking about the insurance pool versus the private insurance. Um, if there were a catastrophe that affected the whole region and everybody was drawn from the pool at once, would there be backup from the facts that the region would probably be declared in a disaster area and there would be federal funds available? Why yeah. don't you go figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> I know just the man to call. He's in Washington. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> Actually, he's going to be right here in the state. <laughs> so he'll be at also. And there is a component to that. Yes, there is a component to that. And uh, if FEMA steps in, uh, they do pick up a portion of uh, the overall costs. And then uh, the rest falls on the insurance company and falls on the district. Uh, if my numbers are correct, it's FEMA may give up to 75%. Uh, then the district would get 12 and a half, and the insurance companies would get 12 and a half. And am I speaking off cuff, or am I, is that pretty much correct? That's, that's how I know. I, you know, I, it, it all depends on what it There's still factors magnitude represented magnitude. there as well. Yeah, that's... So if it's just a state emergency, and they don't get federal help, yeah. then we're... Yeah, again, it's a gamble. Yeah, I'd love to answer your question about this. There's so many variables. I think it's the you don't have to wait and see. Yeah. And you know, it seems to have unlimited offers over there, but who knows? Would that be the same with ESIT? If it's declared a federal emergency or a federal disaster, 
even though we if you were to become a victim of a of a you know regional disaster of that nature, uh, you would have you know you could have access to those same funds even in lieu of your insurance. But we still have our own certificate, and Absolutely. would fall into we might be able to acquire into those federal funds as well. But yeah, we there still have to, you know, depending on the you know, think about it, a tsunami could change the landscape, and you might have to change it back. Right. What's that's not covered in your insurance? You can access federal funds for. Sure. And the federal government, they also give uh, low percentage loans uh, in natural disasters. But then again, it's going back to the public, you know, at that time to try to come up with the funds to pay back that loan, um, or that the pool meets its maximum, and then we the pool comes back to its constituents and asks that they need to participate or give more money into the pool to make up the difference of their overage. So, yeah. But thank you for the question. Thank you for returning. Yeah, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Yes, I make a motion to adjourn the meeting.